Thank you, Aaron, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I know it's a little late in the day for those of us on the East Coast, but we appreciate your time today. Um, my name is Leslie Kimball. I'm executive director of responsibility.org. Um, we are an organization that's been around for over 30 years. Um, we're dedicated to three missions. Do you mind going back one? Yeah, three missions. I know them, but for everyone else, um, to fight underage drinking, to lead efforts to fight drunk driving um, and all forms of impaired driving, and to empower all adults to make a lifetime of responsible choices about alcohol. Um, we're funded by America's Leading Distillers and many folks who do care about these three missions. Um, and our program is our programming is guided by a national advisory board, um, a judicial advisory board, an educational advisory board, and a number of different experts in these fields. Um, and we thought we would join everyone today, um, these panelists. Um, we are all moms, grandmothers, um, and then folks who just care deeply about these issues. Um, so we thought it would be a good time, um, especially as the holidays kick off, holiday parties, um, to host this webinar. So I'll let each of the panelists um, introduce themselves now. I'll come back, set the stage, and then we'll open it up for the discussion. Courtney, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Leslie, and thanks, Aaron, And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm Courtney Armour. I'm the Chief Legal Officer at Responsibility.org and also at the Distilled Spirits Council. And part of my job, I'm the industry liaison for the Code of Responsible Practices for Advertising and Marketing. Um, and in that capacity, over the last few years, we've been discussing a lot on the crossover products uh, and how we can really ensure that as an industry, we can produce, market, and sell these products responsibly. So I'm thrilled to be here today to uh, join my esteemed colleagues to talk about this. Thank you, Courtney. Mary? Hi, I'm Mary Barrazzato. I'm in-house at Brown Foreman Corporation. I've had the um, great luxury of, of watching our industry grow over 30 plus years, and it really has grown and changed. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So I'm really pleased to be here. I also serve um, as chair of the uh, code review committee. So I work closely with Courtney on this and it has been, um, I think really um, impressive the way the industry has rallied around a lot of topics, particularly this most recent one we're gonna talk about today, crossover beverages to ensure we are leading and at the front of ensuring these products that we all produce and all enjoy and consume are done so responsibly. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Thank you, Mary. Kathy. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy Durbin and I'm the Director of Alcohol Beverage Services uh, in Montgomery County, Maryland. I've been with Alcohol Beverage Services for about 20 years. I wear a lot of hats in my position now and um, have in the past. I grew up in the hospitality industry and also was executive director of the Montgomery County Restaurant Association, but also have a degree in social work. So I was uh, I worked with substance abuse prevention issues for many years as well. So glad to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so I'll take a moment to just set the stage. Um, Again, uh, one of Responsibility.org's mission is to inspire a lifetime of responsible alcohol choices. And we do that by starting with, a, you know, if you're a parent and you have a, a young child who can ask, you know, mom, dad, grandma, can I have a sip of that? That's the time to start these conversations. So uh, Responsibility.org does have programming that starts and helps parents feel comfortable having those conversations. Um, we have program at, programs for middle school, students for high school, college, on into adults, um, educating them about what happens when they drink alcohol. Um, so I just thought I'd start with some context setters. Um, underage drinking has gone down about 50% since 1991 when responsibility.org was um, our inception, which we're very proud of. So we need to keep up this great momentum. Um, conversations between parents, caregivers, and their kids have gone up. 30% uh, over the past 20 years. So we believe there's a correlation between the more we have these conversations about underage drinking, our values related to underage drinking and alcohol, those that those rates of underage drinking go down and our kids are safer. 
Um, and then parents are the number one influence on a kid's decision to drink or not to drink. So parents, caregivers, those who care about the kids in your lives, we do really want you to prioritize this as an issue so we can keep those rates going down. As for adults, 62% um, of Americans um, of legal drinking age, 21 and up, do drink alcohol. Um, and among those adults who do drink, 87% report knowing their personal limits and are confident they drink responsibly. So that's a really good, uh, that's good news, but we always need to do our jobs to encourage people to drink responsibly and talk about some of these new products that are coming on the market so that everyone's educated about it and everyone continues to drink responsibly. So I'll turn it over to Mary um, to open up the discussion. Great. Thanks, Leslie. So I'm going to set the stage a little bit for the discussion and talk about you know, how the beverage alcohol industry has, has developed and grown and, and actually diversified um, over a number of years. I think we all recognize the industry has long been segmented into beer, wine, spirits. And by far, you know, beer just on case volume alone has has way um, is significantly um, larger than wine and spirits. You know, in the 1990s to early 2000s, you know, RTDs were kind of the new entry here. You know, they came on the heels of wine coolers. And we all remember these RTDs. They were very, very sweet, very bright colored, typically in bottles, caused a little um, concern at, at the time um, because of the sweetness and the color and the appeal. But these products really never gained, if you want to look at it volume wise, a lot of traction. So just 10 years ago, so 2013, RTDs were less than 3% of the total volume of distilled of alcohol, all beverage alcohol sold. Today though, you know, after the um, onslaught of, of RTD developments in the past number of years, RTDs are at 12% of the total volume of beverage alcohol products sold. So RTDs have surpassed wine. It's pretty remarkable um, in my mind that this product category in less than 10 years has, has become so large. Malt-based seltzers were really the primary driver of these increases over the past number of years. These and other malt-based products like hard teas currently represent about half the volume of RTDs that are sold out there uh, to consumers in the U.S. The, the seltzers have kind of stabilized. Um, they aren't growing at the degree um, they had been growing. And we're seeing a number of other types of RTDs, including spirit-based RTDs, are really accelerating and pushing the category further in, uh, or farther as it continues to grow year to year. It's a healthy category. I think it's here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. So then you kind of go, well, what's driving this growth? And I think we look at consumer, um, in, well, consumer desires first, we're seeing this growth in other than seltzers, primarily uh, based on a desire of consumers to premiumize what they are drinking. And thus they're looking to spirit-based products as a more premium expression in the RTD categories. But what we see most um, prevalent um, in surveys that are done, that consumers are looking to try new products that taste good flavor is the top of, of the pyramid in really driving new uh, consumers to new products, and they're looking for the diversity in it. And then, of course, there's always the convenience factors. But what is really interesting as we trend, you know, RTDs were initially um, the convenience, so the people were drinking these at home. They're, the premiumization of it is really driving them to be more acceptable on premise. So we are seeing a uh, nice growth on premise uh, within the RTD category. But coupled with this, which I think is wonderfully interesting and relevant to our discussion today is the fact that consumers are demanding and looking for low alcohol products and no alcohol products. So they're also helping to drive the, the continued uh, development and introduction of new products in this RTD category. So these 
you know, all of these factors, these consumer desires have really led to the explosion of new products that we're seeing hit the retail shelves. So in addition to the spirit-based products, the low and no alcohol products, we've seen ready to drinks. And these really started during COVID where people were packaging up, you know, a, a pre-packaged mixed drink um, that would then be uh, poured over ice, for example. So not your classic can RTD. And what also developed are what we're gonna talk about now, which are crossover beverages. So Courtney, let me turn it over to you and you might, I guess, define for us, if you will, uh, what, how we view, what we de how we define crossover. Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, and, I, you know, for some of us who have been talking about crossovers ad nauseum for years, it seems so obvious, but I've actually seen um, across the spectrum some confusion around this. So I think it's good to just define our terms. So, you know, what is a, a crossover beverage? What are we talking about here? This is an alcohol version of a popular non-alcohol brand. And that's the key, the, the key component here. Uh, it can come in a few different forms, though. So uh, a lot of them are um, a just a standard non-alcohol brand with no other branding. So that'd be something like a hard Mountain Dew. It just has the, the brand from the non-alcohol version and no other alcohol branding. And then you'll also see some that have co-branding um, of a prominent alcohol brand, but also that prominent non-alcohol brand. Um, but ultimately, the key is there needs to be some prominent use of a non-alcohol brand. Um, if it's just an alcohol brand, that's not a crossover. That's not what we're talking about. That's just probably an RTD. Um, so that's that's what we're talking about here. Um, and as um, Mary noted, the demand for this is really, um, and the interest around this has really come from the huge growth in consumer demand for these RTDs and for that convenience of a, a great taste experience um, at home without having to have all of those bartender skills behind it. So you've seen these consumer um, product uh, companies get interested in, in this market. Um, but as their interest has risen and as we've seen these products gaining popularity over the last few years, there have been a few concerns um, that have been raised around them from industry members. You know, as the alcohol industry, we are actually very conservative and we take responsible advertising very, very seriously. Um, and so there was there was naturally some concern around new entrants coming in who aren't used to operating that way, um, but also some concern from consumers and from regulators. Um, and really, the the concerns are grounded in kind of two buckets. One is confusion, the potential to mistake or um, you know, mistakenly buy or consume these products that have uh, non-alcohol branding on them. We wanna make sure when people are buying and consuming alcohol, they know what they're doing there, right? And then secondly, the potential appeal to children and really the other responsible marketing obligations that we all live by day to day in the alcohol industry. So those are the two buckets of concerns that we've seen. Um, and really everyone has a role in addressing these concerns from the beginning of the chain, the supplier tier, all the way down to um, the consumer and their responsibility after they purchase these products and take them home. So to address some of these concerns, um, the, the code review board that Mary and I participate in, uh, about a year ago, we developed some guidance for suppliers and retailers um, to address some of these concerns. And again, the, the guidance really can be boiled down to trying to give some practical tips on avoiding that potential for confusion and ensuring responsible marketing. So on the supplier side, um, the producers of these products, we wanted to make sure that the packaging is uh, composed in a way that's distinct from that, that non-alcohol popular branding so that consumers are clear um, what they're purchasing, that they're not purchasing you know, the, the standard non-alcohol brand product. Um, we wanna make sure that you're making packaging that is clear that it contains alcohol. Um, and you also wanna make sure that suppliers are uh, marketing it responsibly. Uh, all marketing and advertising needs to primarily appeal to that legal drinking age adult and, and older population, uh, but also, 
uh, abides by all of the other provisions uh, in our code of responsible advertising. Uh, but once the suppliers release those products to the wholesalers and it goes to the retailers, that's when folks like Kathy have to step in. And um, so we put together a little bit of guidance on how retailers can thoughtfully and responsibly merchandise these products. And some of the guidance that we put in there, um, thinking it through, relates to that responsible merchandising, ensuring that um, where you're placing it makes it very clear that this product contains alcohol you know, not merchandising it in a way where it could be confused for that non-alcohol version, um, not placing it in an area that primarily appeals to children, you know, don't put these products in the toy aisle. Um, and then ensuring that employees are properly educated and trained on the products, that they know what these products are, so that they can manage them appropriately with customers and um, answer any of those questions. Um, so those are some of the things that we've been working on um, on the, the supplier side. We can go to the next slide. Um, and I will continue my soapbox for just one moment if y'all will bear with me. Um, one other important thing uh, related to any alcohol product is making sure that we practice moderation. For anyone who's choosing to drink, we need to practice moderation. Um, but you know, what does that mean? We all need a reminder on this and we all need an education on this from time to time. So according to the US Dietary Guidelines for Americans, those who choose to drink should do so in moderation. And that really means up to one serving of alcohol per day for women and up to two for men. Um, and of course, some people should not drink at all if you're pregnant if you are under the legal drinking age, if you're taking medications that are contraindicated, or if you have a substance abuse disorder or, or a number of things. Um, but for those who, who do choose to drink, please do so in moderation. And part of that is understanding what a standard drink is. So according to the US Dietary Guidelines, a standard drink is the equivalent to 0.6 ounces of pure ethanol. So for a 12 ounce beer, that would be a 5% ABV, and that would be 0.6 um, ounces of pure ethanol. Uh, for five ounces of 12% ABV wine, that uh, would also be 0.6 ounces of ethanol. And for 1.5 ounces of 40% ABV uh, spirits, that's at 80 proof, that would be 0.6 ounces of ethanol. So then we get down to the ready to drink category where the crossover products fit in. Um, and why we're talking about this in this particular um, uh, webinar today. Uh, well, crossover products, they usually come in cans and bottles and a lot of them are low ABV, but some of them are higher. And what's really important is to be mindful of uh, how many servings and how many standard drinks you are about to consume when you partake in that product, because it's not always the same. So it's important to be mindful of those two components that you can see on the side of the slide right now. What is the volume of that package and what is the ABV? And from there, you can calculate how many standard servings um, and standard drinks are in that package. And if you need some help, we have a website, standarddrinks.org, that has a handy calculator that can help you calculate that. Okay, so I'm officially stepping off of my soapbox now. Um, Kathy, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk through uh, the retailer uh, responsibility in this area. Um, thank you, Courtney. Well, I'm gonna speak a little bit about retailing, but mostly about um, per, um, parents' responsibilities as well. Um, so retailers, I think that you did a great job of outlining that um, you know, there should be protocols and responsible policies in place to prevent sales to people under the age of 21. Um, any retailer should have effective ID and carding policies. And most importantly, um, as you stated, uh, train the staff properly. They need to understand um, the different, uh, different types of crossover brand products. They need to be placed properly and um, they need to be set aside from the non-alcoholic beverage counterparts. So um, running retail stores now is, um, it's funny the, I, I, as I go into parents' responsibility, um, I feel like sometimes uh, this all flows together and we're having these same conversations, but it's really important for us to do what we can to keep young people safe. Um, and knowing what you're selling is, is a big part of it. Um, 
So uh, parental responsibility involves actively monitoring and ensuring your child's safety by providing the necessary tools to make any informed decisions that you can. So um, research and studies have shown that alcohol is not safe for kids. Um, parents should have open conversations with their children about the different types of alcohol products and explain the potential risks associated with the alcohol consumption, such as impaired judgment and health consequences. They should also educate themselves about the various types of crossover products available in today's market and establish clear rules and boundaries regarding alcohol consumption. I think we had a conversation earlier about making sure when you do bring those products into your home that they're separated as well, because it could be very confusing. Um, parents should lead by example by modeling responsible drinking behaviors. This can help shape your child's understanding of responsible alcohol use. Mm -hmm. And finally, keep an eye on your child's activities and social interactions and be aware of any signs of alcohol consumption. Delaying the use of alcohol will help reduce potential alcohol issues as children grow into adults. Always encourage open communication. The more informed you are, the more informed they are, and the better decisions they can make. Thanks, Leslie. I think it goes back over to you now. Yep, thank you. Um, so I'm just going to wrap with what uh, caregivers should know. Um, so caregivers defined as anyone who is taking care of a child in their home or a place where alcohol uh, may be. Um, so I just think it's it's very important for all adults to understand what you yourself are drinking if you choose to be drinking or those if you aren't if you aren't drinking that particular time what the people around you are drinking just so you can be aware of what your kids may be seeing as well. Um, we always encourage everyone, adults and kids, to make plans to keep them safe, how to get them home safely. You make those plans before you go out or before you're at the party, um, just so you know how you're going to get yourself home safely. Um, and we encourage everyone to model responsibility, so model responsible behavior. You can have fun and be responsible at the same time. Um, it's very easy to do. Uh, like I said earlier, the majority of Americans do that. So um, we just like to remind everyone about that during the holidays. It's been a stressful year, um, uh, but we have to keep that top, top of mind, of course. Um, and then social and mental health. We've seen a lot of that post-pandemic, a lot of conversations about mental health and how that, how that affects your choices around alcohol, your choices around exercise, your choices around nutrition. So it's very important to think about your social and mental health um, when you choose to drink. And if you do find that you are heading into to what you may consider a slippery slope, talk to your doctor, call a mental health professional, talk to a trusted friend. It's There's never any shame of sort of checking in on yourself. It's always a good idea to reflect about your drinking behavior. So um, there should be no shame in that. We strongly encourage folks to do that as well. Um, and then the next slide, just in terms of parents in general and um, resources that responsibility.org has. Um, do you mind going? Oh, this is one. Okay. Um, have conversations about, um, like, like we said, Kathy said this earlier, have conversations with your kids. Um, those can start as early as those kids are asking the questions. Um, treat them uh, fairly as you answer them. You can talk directly to those kids in an age appropriate way. Um, the other thing that we talked about was just keeping drinks for kids separate. So if that's in your, we've, and all of the, the panelists about, and I, we talked about that ahead of time. So I'm a mom of two teens. Um, I feel comfortable having some of these products in my fridge, but my children, my kids know where their, where their shelf is and where their shelf isn't. Um, somebody like Courtney, maybe she can talk about this at the end. Uh, she's got littler kids. They may not be in her fridge. So um so we can talk about that at the end too. Um, only purchase what will be consumed. Therefore, you're sort of monitoring it and keeping track of that. Um, understand the risks of serving or supplying. Again, I have teens. When my friends, when my kids have their friends over, it is my job to understand where those where those drinks are, those products, those beverages are. If the kids have access to it, it is my responsibility to protect that and know what they're doing and watch over them. So um, it's a heavy responsibility the older they get, um, but I know it's 
super important. Um, and the last is a shameless plug for responsibility.org. Um, we have a ton of resources, um, specifically under underage drinking, there's conversation starters. Um, parents sometimes just, they don't want their kids to roll their eyes at them. They don't know where to start. They think it's going to be a miserable conversation, but it is not. It's a conversation that goes on and on and on, no matter if you hear a story on the radio or on the news or you're reading something or you see something on TikTok. Just ask your kids about it. They want to know your values. They want to know your boundaries and they want to know that you care. So just go ahead and have those conversations when those um, when those come up. So I'll, um, I'll end it with that and then open the floor. We do have two questions. So I'll ask our panelists if there's anything else that you wanted to add yeah. and pause Absolutely. there and then we can go to the questions. Yeah, I would love to add um, just a few anecdotes about uh, being a parent to some younger kids and protecting them from access to alcohol and respond responsibly managing alcohol in my household. So I, do, I think it's a little different when you're dealing with, I have a one and a half year old and a five year old, um, and Leslie, you have teenagers. With teenagers, you know, you're, you're educating them on what it is and keeping it away from them, but also making sure they're not, you know, trying to sneak and get it right. That's a different um, responsibility for a parent uh, with a one and a half year old and a five year old. I'm constantly keeping dangerous things away from my kids. Um, and that's, you know, you know, cleaning products under the sink. That is, you know, certain sharp things I had to, um, you know, lock up one of our drawers recently because my one and a half year old keeps trying to grab butter knives and forks out of it. And I caught him chasing the cat. So I had to lock that up. So same thing goes with um, alcohol products in my fridge. I have some crossover products and I keep them all on the very top shelf where they can't reach them. Um, all alcohol products in my house for my kids are out of reach. Um, and that that's what works for me for really young kids. Um, but I'm also, I'm a busy working mama and I have, uh, you know, my village that I've hired to help me. And so I have uh, a nanny and I make sure that she's educated on what is alcohol, has alcohol in it and what does not. Um, I had a funny little story where I overheard my babysitter and my nanny talking to each other, um, trying to um, decide whether or not my boxed uh, iced coffee in the fridge had alcohol in it. Um, one of them was telling the other that they couldn't drink it because it was wine. And it's like, it's not boxed wine. That is coffee. Um, but it, it was a good cue for me to have a conversation again with my nanny and, you know, just make sure she was clear on what was alcohol and what was not alcohol. So she wasn't confused. Courtney, that's a great point. I, I think of, of having to reassess over the years as my, my children get older and now I have three daughters in their twenties. I can't believe I do, but I do. And, um, even when they have friends over my 22 year old has friends over, you know, I really have to think about it because it wasn't until one of the times they came over and we just had, I think some beer out or something. We weren't monitoring it. We weren't really thinking about it because our children don't really drink that much. They might have, you know, a beverage or something, but you know, these, some of these kids were going after it. And I, you know, I sat down with my husband and I sat down with my daughter. I said, when they come over the next time, and you know, that time we even didn't want to be, you know, ending the party, but um, we wanted to um, just know that they could have a good time and set up those parameters before they came in mm -hmm. so that they didn't even know that we were like watching them. We had an event in our house and, and I could hear um, one of the uh, young men didn't even know that I was you know, on the porch and they could, they were talking about where they were going to go later and what they were going to do. And it was so funny. I was like, I don't want to hear all of this, but you <laughs> have to continually reassess as your kids get older and make it safe, a safe environment for them. Even if they're, even if they've turned 21, it's mm -hmm. something that you have to do to, to help keep them safe. Absolutely. Um, all right, we, we have some questions um, and we'll just field them amongst our experts here. Um, what, are, what are the, oh, sorry, hold on, I lost the top of this. Um, what about the other way around? So we've talked about crossover products. What if White Claw released a non-alcoholic seltzer? What is that product called and what risks arise from a product like that? Is that different than a crossover? That is different. Um, and that's why we wanted to, to 
define our terms early on uh, with any alcohol product or alcohol brand, you know, there's different responsibilities that come along with that and how you market it and sell it. Um, but that is, that is different uh, because you're not going to have white claw is an alcohol brand. So you're not going to have confusion of someone accidentally, if someone accidentally drinks a non-alcohol white claw, there's not a huge risk there. Right. So it's, it's just a very, I think it's a different dynamic um, I don't know, Mary, if you want to add anything. No, but even in the occasion where someone um, um, is picking a non-alcoholic white claw, I think what's critical in any of these products is clear communication on the label of what the product is. And that's the responsibility of the supplier to ensure when someone picks that up, you know, what is legible on it is it's maybe non-alcoholic white claw. But again, I don't think the confusion, as Courtney points out, is, is quite as problematic as it is when there are products that are you know, so well established as non-alcoholic that suddenly have a small card or some other mm -hmm. minor indication that it is now, it now contains alcohol. Yeah, that's fair. For me, it would be the confusion about if I were to have real white claw in my fridge, not that that's not real, but white claw in my fridge, and then also have that there, I would, I would want to be very careful about the confusion for my own kids, because again, they're, they're teens. So great question. We have three more. Um, how do we look at the crossover products from the beer industry? Perhaps that's a question for Kathy, who looks at alcohol as a total category versus spirits only. So for, um, I'm, I'm not sure of the question. So if it's a if it's a beer crossover product is what I or just a crossover product from the beer industry. I mean, I think it would be uh, the same thing. It's it's educating. It's understanding what it is that you're drinking. And it's also placement, proper placement in any retail environment. So I think that's where the confusion lies. People just think I mean, in the I remember with RTDs first starting, everybody thought anything in a can was an RTD um, and they all were malt based. And then people awesome spirit-based RTDs are coming out. People are still confused by that. So, you know, as a, uh, as a person that's going into an establishment, they, you need to really read the labels and know what you're purchasing as a supplier and a retailer, you need to define those areas so that, so that the customers know where, what they're purchasing and where they're going. So yeah, it's confusing. We've all talked about how confusing it is. So we really have to spend a little bit more time on this and understand what we're selling and what we're drinking. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, and then how do you all feel about Sunny D coming out with the seltzer? Can you speak to other, this is in quotes, child brands that have that now have alcohol in them? I can speak to that one or... Mary, unless you want to take it, you can start it all. Wrap up. Okay. <laughs> so we did. We had a few complaints come in to the code review board related to Sunny D and the um, concern that it did appeal to children. And the code review board carefully evaluated um, their the advertiser's response and the materials, and found that in fact the um, the packaging was in violation of the code because it was primarily a, a brand that was marketed to children in the non-alcohol form. Um, and it was found that the packaging was not distinct enough from the original non-alcohol product branding. And so the, the company that makes Sunny D is going back and reevaluating their packaging to make it more distinct to ensure that it uh, could not be confused and appealing to children who may enjoy the, the non-alcohol version. I, 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 we're gonna sound like broken records here. It's all about the packaging and clearly communicating to consumers what, what they have in their hand. And it's incumbent upon whether you are starting with a child brand, if you will, or you're starting with a Jack Daniels you need to communicate what that product is. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's simple. I mean, it's, it's a straightforward precaution or, or, or admonition um, that we would suggest. And if you're starting with something like Sunny D, uh, you need to do a little more 
to make sure that it's very distinct, very different, uh, to make it clear to any audience that um, it, it's an alcohol product and not the original one. Now, their, their packaging did say vodka on it in large letters, but children can't read. And sometimes caretakers don't notice or can't read. And so for, for that, it was found that they needed to do more to make it more distinct visually. Thank you, Courtney and Mary. Um, the next one is from D'Anthony, who's one of Responsibility.org's parenting influencers. So hello, D'Anthony, I'm thrilled that you sent in a question. His question is, how do you explain to a child why you choose to drink an alcoholic beverage, especially if you're telling them that it's bad for them? Um, anyone want to take that? I can, I can I can start yeah, it, it and then we can go from there. I, it, it, that's, it's, that's a tough question because you know, when your children do get to be teens, they're like, well, you did it or you're doing it or I heard your stories or something. So that's why I don't tell stories. But also, um, you know, having that conversation about the legal drinking age, what alcohol does to your brain before you're, you know, of that age, um, research that's been done and how it's so much safer to wait to put off as long as you can to drink alcohol because of the effects later in life. Um, and so, uh, it's all about keeping your kids safe and having those conversations and we're not on the same playing field either. You know, you're an, a, of age adult and there's laws that prevented, um, people from under 21 from drinking. So, um, sometimes they don't understand or care about the laws, but, uh, keeping them safe is a, is a good conversation. Yeah, thank you. And uh, D'Anthony, for my children, I often talk about your brain's not fully developed yet. Your body's still growing. Um, so just like I don't really want my kids running around with a ton of caffeine in their system, right. alcohol is a no go. So um, their brains, their, their brains and bodies just are keep they're still growing. It's not it's not healthy for them. So um, I hope that helps. D'Anthony, we have a ton of resources on our site for that, too. So I can reach out to you afterwards as well. OK, why do they card for non-alcoholic products that have an alcohol trademark? And I love this question because it kind of goes back to the first one about White Claw. But anyone want to take that one? Kathy, do you want to, I can start. I, can, I mean, I would just say that for, for the first thing comes up top of my mind, it's a, they usually sold in environments where both products are being sold. And so it's just a policy for that business, which they can have. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, I think that's another educational topic to have conversation. There are some states too that do not allow the sale of non-alcohol extensions of alcohol products to um, to minors. So, um, which is really grounded more in the like the O'Doul's the, the non-alcohol beers, the um, badging that comes along. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. And then I'm not sure, I don't, this one's new for me. So are you aware of any pending or new legislation on the horizon that will require the supplier or producer to more clearly make it visible that the product has alcohol not leaving up to the discretion of the producer? I see certain energy drinks that look the same as say a seltzer. Thank you. I haven't seen any legislation around that in particular. Um, TTB at the federal level does regulate and approve um, most uh, labels on alcohol products. There are some that fall under FDA and FDA doesn't do a pre-approval process. Um, I have not seen any proposed legislation to change um, the requirements there as far as the, the packaging and the supplier is concerned. There has been a little bit of legislation and regulatory movement on uh, merchandising. So the standards that are required of retailers and where they can place these products and whether or not they require extra signage to make it clear that there's alcohol in them. Thank you. I tend to think you know, that's where we will see um, further development if these continue to be perceived as a problem uh, with respect to how they're labeled or merchandised. Uh, given TTB's jurisdiction and a reticence of the states to take on labeling, I think it's going to be all about retail sales. Mm -hmm. Which I think is what makes sense, honestly, because across the country, you want to have one label across the whole country. You don't want to have to have a patchwork um, requirements for labels. So I think that makes sense. Sounds good. 
Um, I don't see any other questions. There was one that um, I think Aaron an answered, so thank you. But for everyone else's uh, uh, information, we will, this video, this webinar has been recorded via video, so it will be posted on the responsibility.org website, and everyone who registered will get that in their email. So forward it to your friends or folks who you care about who want to um, to think about these issues as the holidays go on. And um, we wish you all a very healthy and happy and responsible holiday season. And we very much appreciate you joining us today. Is there anything else, uh, Mary, Courtney, Kathy, that you wanted to add? No. Okay. Thank Happy you. Holidays. Thank you all yeah, so thank much. You thank you for, for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you.